from now to doomsday. You can do all the right things that you want to do. You can be as right as you think you are. And it's still not enough. His grace. It's His grace that makes all the difference. We're coming to a board here because of His righteousness. So in case there's anybody standing there today thinks you're good enough, there's none of us good enough. It's all about His matchness, His wonderful grace. We're going to sing how deep the Father's love for me. Come on, let's lavish Him with our worship this morning. How deep the Father's love for us. How vast beyond all. Pastor David. Praise the Lord. You may be seated. 
Amen. Good to see all of you on this summer's day and uh, take advantage of it this morning. Uh, it was snowing probably during the week or something and uh, it's good to see all of you gathered in the house of the Lord this morning on this Lord's day. We're coming around his table. <clears throat> we do that every Sunday. We're going to do it again this morning. We're coming to his table. Just to look at that table, just a piece of timber. Someone, they measured it, they designed it, uh, fixed it together, uh, uh, polished it, uh, put varnish on it, they designed it. Just a simple table, but it's his table. It's his table. We're coming to that table. We're eating the bread that's upon it, drinking the wine that's on it. Let's speak this morning of his broken body. Broken. That body that was marred. Couldn't recognize it. It was for you. It was for me. Because of our sins. Because of our sins. Our wickedness. Our iniquities. Because of our sins. He was broken. Broken that you may be remade. Wine that speaks of precious blood. Blood that was shed. Shed willingly for us. Shed for you. That you may be washed clean. Praise God this morning. The price was paid. The penalty was dealt with. Thank God this morning for him, the Lamb of God, that takes away the sin of the world. Aren't you glad this morning your sin's been taken away? Amen. Amen. Aren't you glad it's been, as we say, thrown into the sea of God's forgetfulness? And I know the old devil will cast it up, but God will never cast it up. He remembers it no more. Will you say, praise the Lord? Let's bow our heads, shall we? On the same night, on the same night in which he was betrayed, and that must have pained him as well. Nothing is bad when somebody you love and somebody you care about and somebody you've worked with and prayed with, to take your heart and to stop it. On the same night in which he was betrayed, he took bread and he broke it. And he said, this is my body, which is broken for you. This do in remembrance of me. And likewise, after the same manner, he also took the cup. And he said, this cup is the New Testament. In my blood, shed for many for the remission of sins. This do as often as you drink it in remembrance of me. Brother, sister, this morning, come with me. Come to his table. Let's eat. Let's drink. Let's remember him. Let's give him thanks and praise and honor and glory. Let's worship him for all that he has done for us. Brethren, will you come forward? He took bread.
is thy faithfulness oh God Lord we worship you this morning we love you because you first loved us Lord Father you lifted us from the mire and from the clay and you set us among princes we worship you and we adore you this morning there's no one like our God this morning we thank you for your love Lord we thank you for this great house Lord and we ask you for every member of it Father everyone standing here in your presence every head bowed Lord Father we ask you your blessing would be upon them we see those standing here Lord who are battling great illnesses in their bodies today, Lord. Father, we ask your grace, your mercy, your goodness towards them. Father, those at home, Lord, those who can't even make it to the house because they're so well, Lord, we just ask, we remember them this morning, every one of them, Lord. Father, would you bless your people? Would you come, Lord? There is no one like you this morning. We worship and we adore you, Lord. Father, we ask you to move in this house this morning. Lord, bless the choir as they come to minister, as your servant comes to handle your word, as he ministers your word, Father, would you anoint them, Lord? Father, would you let that anointing flow from heart to heart and from seat to seat, Lord? Touch bodies, touch lives, Lord. And if there be those here this morning that don't know you, Father, that don't know your grace and your goodness, Lord, would you draw them to the foot of the old rugged cross and would you save souls? Glorify your name. We'll give you all the praise, the honor and glory. In Jesus' lovely name we ask it. Amen. Thank you, Pastor. Will you turn to the Gospel of Mark, chapter 14, please. The Gospel of Mark, chapter 14. And we will start to read at verse 1. After two days was the feast of the Passover and of unleavened bread. And the chief priests and the scribes sought how they might take him by craft and put him to death. But they said, 
They were not only priests, they were politicians. But they said, not on the feast day, lest there be an uproar of the people. And being in Bethany, in the house of Simon the leper. He was once a leper. He couldn't have this unless he had been cleansed, and he had been cleansed. And being in Bethany in the house of Simon the leper, as he sat at meat, there came a woman having an alabaster box of ointment of spikenard, very precious. And she broke the box and poured it on his head. And there were some that had indignation within themselves and said, why was this waste of the ointment made? Actually, in the Greek New Testament, the word for indignation conveys the the snorting of horses. That's how much they murmured. Mm. For it might have been sold for more than 300 pence and have been given to the poor and they murmured it against her. Jesus said, let her alone. Why trouble ye her? She hath wrought a good work on me. For ye of the poor with you always. And whensoever you will, ye may do them good. But me, if not always. She hath done what she could. She has come aforetime to anoint my body to the bearing. Verily, I say unto you, wheresoever this gospel shall be preached throughout the whole world, this also that she has done shall be spoken of for a memorial of her. 2,000 years later, we're talking about her this morning. And Judas Iscariot, one of the 12, went on to the chief priest to betray him Onto them. And when they heard it, they were glad, promised to give him money, and he sought how he might conveniently betray him. Father, again, shut us in with your lovely self. Still everything here this morning, our thoughts, that we may see you in all your beauty and in all your glory. For we ask it all in Jesus' name. Amen. If love is true love, there must always be a certain extravagance in it. It does not nicely calculate the less or more. It is not concerned to see how little it can decently give. If it gave all it had, if indeed it gave all the world the gift would still be too little. There is a recklessness in love which refuses to count the cost. It is one of the tragedies in life that often we are moved to do something beautiful and we do not do it. It may be that we are too shy to do it and that we feel awkward about it. It may be that second thoughts suggest a more prudent and common sense course. Love comes in the simplest things. The impulse to send a letter to someone to thank them for something they have done. The impulse to tell someone how much we love them and how grateful we are to them. The impulse to give some special gift or to speak some special word. And the tragedy is that the impulse is so often strangled at birth. This would be a so much lovelier world if there were more people like this precious woman who acted on her impulse of love because she knew in her heart of hearts if she did not do it then, she would never do it at all. How that 
love extravagant impulse of kindness must have uplifted the heart of the Lord Jesus ours before he went to the cross. In fact, he declared in verse 9, truly or verily I say unto you, wheresoever this gospel shall be preached throughout the whole world, this also that she hath done shall be spoken of for a memorial of her. And here I am fulfilling our Lord's words, speaking of this memorial act of this precious young woman. Mark records in verse 4, and there were some that had indignation within themselves and said, why was this waste of the ointment made? Others looked at it and said, it was a waste. There are people like that in the Christian church this morning. They look on things like that and they say, it's a waste. Brothers and sisters, there are always some, but the some always have a ringleader. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. And if you read John's account of this very same incident in John chapter 12, the ringleader was Judas Iscariot, Mm -hmm. the treasurer of the apostolic band. He estimated the value of this beautiful gift. 300 denai. A man's wages for a full year. Which would have paid his bills, his mortgage, kept his family. What Mary did offended him. What Mary did offended him. Offended his avarice (coughs) heart (coughs) and some foolish disciples, and you always have foolish disciples joined in the criticism. We have had them in this church for the past 61 years. They have joined in without really thinking what they're doing. (coughs) Note the word indignation. They were angry. They called it a waste. Mm -hmm. Friend, when it comes to Jesus, what you give him and do for him and do to him is never a waste. Mm -hmm. And then to justify themselves comes the old argument like Mary's memorial down through the centuries It might have been sold for more than 300 pence and and given to the poor. Oh, the poor. Pity the poor. Sell it and give it to the poor. These wonderful believers that talk about this. Sell it and give it to the poor. And note the next line. They murmured against her. And do you know what that murmuring revealed? The disciples had not fully learned to love the Lord Jesus as they should. That's what the murmuring revealed, that they had not learned to love the Lord Jesus as they should. Harry's sitting at the table. Lazarus is there, whom he had raised from the dead. Simon the leper was there, whom he had cleansed. It was a great testimony meeting. It was lovely, and he was sitting quiet. And this young woman, who was not invited to that feast, it was a man's feast, it wasn't a woman's feast. She observed him, how quiet he was. And she knew he was going through something. If you love a person deeply and observe them, You can even read their thoughts. If you love a person so deeply and observe them, you can even read their thoughts. You remember another incident in Bethany in Luke chapter 10 that Martha grumbled that Mary wasn't serving. And where was Mary? Sitting at his feet. If you want to learn anything, 
sit at his feet. If you want to know anything, sit at his feet. And sitting at his feet every time he came to Bethany enlarged Mary's mind and she began to understand the things of the kingdom while the twelve were debating who would sit in this throne and who would sit on the other throne and who would be the chancellor of the exchequer and who would be in the cabinet. She observed him. That's what it means this morning, ladies and gentlemen, to love Jesus. Brother, could I ask you something? Do you love the Lord Jesus as you should? I'm going to ask you again. Do you love the Lord Jesus as you should? I'm going to ask you once more so that you'll remember it. Do you love the Lord Jesus as you should? That's the sign of a murmur. That's the sign of a murmur. They don't love Jesus enough. Her loving act showed up the lack of the lack of imagination that was in their hearts. A person in love is always full of imagination. A young man in love is always full of imagination. How he can please her. Woman in love is full of imagination. How she can please him. And this woman was in love. In love with the Lord Jesus. And she began to rake her head. He's going through something. I know he's going to die. They're talking about thrones and talking about driving the Romans out of Judea and, and, and restoring the lost kingdom to Israel again. What can I do for him? What can I do for him? Like David what shall I render unto the Lord for all his benefits? And that was the thought that was in her heart. Because real love is always thinking of its object and seeks to bless its object. I wonder how Mary felt when she saw the angry looks and the bitter words against her. Who did she think she was to do this thing? You weren't invited to this guest, to this feast. You're not a guest at this feast. Oh, we know that Martha is serving, but she's only a server. She's only a waitress. But you weren't invited. And now you've get Christ the party. And you've come in with your hair hanging down around you. Your hair should be tied. The hair hanging round is a harlot's token. You're like a harlot. You're walking in. But there was a purpose in her hair hanging down those tresses right to her shoulders. She get Christ the party. It's about time some of you ladies get Christ the party. It's time that some of you get Christ the party. But all in Simon's house did not reckon on Christ's reaction. He suddenly speaks, after being quiet, he suddenly speaks. Verse 6. Let her alone! It was like a whiplash. Let her alone! Wow! What a rebuke! Boy, it was like a slap in the face to Judas Iscariot. Let her alone. Let her alone. His word was like a whiplash to their hardened hearts. She hath wrought a good work on me, for ye have the poor always. Do you hear that? You have the poor always. The poor will be here tomorrow, brother. The poor will be here next month, sister. The poor will be here next year, brothers and sisters. The poor will be here every year. You have me always. And whensoever you will, you will do them good. But me, you have not always. What she has done is a special act. See the great New Testament. Buy it. See that she had wrought a good work on me. 
Do you know what the Greek New Testament says? She has done a beautiful thing to me. Isn't that lovely? She has done a beautiful thing to me. Long as it's sister, since you've done a beautiful thing. Come on, sister, I'm talking to you. The doors are locked this morning. Long as it's since you've done a beautiful thing. Long as it, brother, since you've done a beautiful thing. In other words, the moment that has come to her will not come again. And look at me, sister. Look at me, brother. There are moments that will come to you that you will feel the impulse and you will feel very strong. And those moments will go away and they will not come back again. And Mary realized this was the moment. She seized the moment. Judas, he seized the moment because as soon as that was over, he went to the high priests and communed with them to see how much he could betray him and see how much they would give him. 300 denai. A man's wages for a year. His expenses for a year. Judas got 30 pieces of silver. But what Mary gave was three times greater than what Judas got in his hand from the chief priests. It's amazing. This was this woman. Could I stop here and ask? And there's a silence here this morning, and that silence has been created by the Holy Spirit. Could I stop here and ask, when you felt the impulse to minister to him, to minister to him, not to minister to the church, not to minister to me or to Pastor Purse or any of the pastors, when did you feel the last impulse to minister to him? When was it last? Why did you not do it? <coughs> Why did you not do it? Were you afraid of criticism? Were you afraid of so-called hyper-spirituals who would say, oh, you would need to pray about that, brother? The only praying that some of these people do is P-R-E-Y-I-N-G. Not P R A Y. I-N-G. Were you afraid of being talked about? Afraid of being said, she's an Egypt. He's an Egypt. Oh, he's not right in the head. Oh, oh. And that's what the, the 12 are thinking. This is an impulsive young woman. It's gone to her head. Oh, it's, it's gone. But no, she brought this. Now, she must have lived in the vicinity. And she must have went back to the cottage where, where Lazarus lived and where her sister Martha lived and got that vase, that spike nard of ointment. She must have went and got it and brought it to the house. Mary loved him. She did not fully understand totally what he was going through and what he would go through. And she wanted to do something for him. And she did. Now watch the next statement from our Lord. He says in verse 8, she hath done what she could. I would, I'm not so fussed about hearing him say, well done, good and faithful servant. And I say that reverently. But when I stand at the beam of seat, I would like him to say to the Senate, because Bema means Senate. I would like him to say to the Senate, Jim McConnell has done what he could. <clears throat> that to me would be my reward for all eternity. <clears throat> that to me would be my reward for all eternity. Jim McConnell has done what he could. 
Now, when you stand at the throne, wouldn't it be lovely if he said about you, and you, and you, she has done what she could. He has done what she could. And I know as I'm talking, the Holy Spirit is smiting your consciences, is smiting your hearts. Have you done what you could? And I'm looking back over the years, and I'm saying, Lord, don't take me home yet. Spare me a wee bit longer, and I'll do more, and I'll do more, and I'll do more, and I'll go mad, and I'll do more for you. I want to do what I can. I want to be lovely, Pastor David, if every person in this congregation this morning did what they could. If we did, the kingdom of God would arrive and come upon us. If we did what we could, we would have the revival that we're earnestly watching for. The result would be astronomical. The kingdom of God would usher in upon us. But listen again to our Lord in verse 8. He says, now listen to this one. And this hit me. She has come aforehand. Say aforehand. Say it again. She has come aforehand. Would you say it loud once more? To anoint my body to the burying. Oh, Nicodemus will come with spices to anoint the body. But it's too late. She has come aforehand. She has discerned what's going to happen to me. She's coming to anoint my body to the burying. Isn't that fantastic? She has come aforehand. Let's have a wee thought about this word, aforehand, this morning. Aforehand tells me we can come too late. I'll repeat that again. A forehand tells me we can come too late. If you have love for your Lord, show it now. If you have love for your Lord, express it now. Let your imagination become sanctified and give to him what's in your heart. A forehand tells me something more. A forehand tells me do to him, do for him, and do while you are alive. These Christians that die and leave their wills for the kingdom of God. But notice, they die and leave their wills, but while they're alive, they want to spend it. <clears throat> so when they die, they leave their wills. She did it while she was alive. 300 denai, a year's wages. <clears throat> she gave it while she was alive. A forehand. Just as you don't show love to your loved ones when they are alive and when they're dead, you heap the coffin lid with flowers. Don't die without fulfilling your aspirations. Don't die with desires strangled to help the work of God. Help the work of God now. Help the work of God now. Help it this afternoon. Help it tonight. Help it tomorrow. Help it this coming week. Help it now. Don't wait. Because if you wait, the enemy will take that away from you. That beautiful thing that has been created in your heart by the Holy Spirit. Think about these things. Oh, you're listening to me this morning. And I feel, your, I feel your eyes upon me this morning. Go and commune with your own heart. And say not a word to anyone. Look at me. Don't say a word to your husband. Oh, but he's told, don't say a word to him. Don't say a word to your wife. She's close. Even the closest can discourage us. Even the closest may not understand the spiritual thing. They may understand you in the natural things love and all that sort of thing. But when it comes to spiritual things, they may not understand. Commune with your own heart. And that's what this woman did. She didn't talk to Martha. Martha, should I do this? She didn't talk to Lazarus. Lazarus, should I do this? 
she communed with her own heart and she did it. And she did it unto him. Can I hear a praise the Lord this morning? Because they're so quiet, you're scaring the life out of me. Well, you say, praise the Lord. <laughs> Commune with her, your own heart and come to him and worship him and, and give to him your act of love. I must close. I've said enough, but I must say this. Oh, I'm all right for time, Pastor David. Of 10 minutes, hallelujah. Give me 10 minutes more. Uh-huh. Of 10 minutes. I've said enough, but I must say this. Do you see verse 6? The master said, She hath wrought a good work on me. Now, I want you to listen to me carefully. The Greek students know that there are <clears throat> two Greek words for this word good. There is the word agathos, which means the moral quality of a thing. And there's people here, and morally, you are clean, clean, clean. Mm. But the moral quality of a thing can be so cold, cold, cold. Mm. Mm. Hello. Mm. The word good means agathos, the moral quality of a thing. You're perfectly clean, but you're cold. And then there's another word. And it's called kalos. K-A-L-O-S. And the Lord uses this word kalos here, which means winsome, attractive, and beautiful. Winsome, attractive, and beautiful. There's some morally clean Christians, if I fail, I wouldn't go and talk to them because they wouldn't understand. They just wouldn't understand. They're so clean. They're Pharisaic. But there's other pastors, if I fell, I could go and speak to them, and they would help me, and they would love me. Can I hear a praise the Lord? Can I hear a praise the Lord? Kill us. Jesus is saying, Mary has won my heart. And that's what's in the margin of your Bible. Beautiful. Brothers and sisters, ladies and gentlemen, this morning. Jesus has won our hearts. How many of us has won his heart that he can say, there's a man who loves me. There's a woman who loves me. There's a young woman who's Heart is mine. Mm. There's a young man whose heart is bursting with fervent love for me. What way does he look at you? Mm. I want him to look at old McConnell and say, the old bishop, he has his weaknesses, but he loves me. Mm. And I do love him with all my heart. Mm. That's what he's looking for this morning. As I have grown older, I have found more and more. When you're younger, you're a young whippersnapper. You think you know it all, you know, when you're younger. Probably Pastor David thinks he knows it all too. When I was, when I was his age, I thought the same. But now when I'm 81, I know nothing. I know nothing. And I'm learning every day. Learning every day. It was important to the Lord Jesus after he had risen from the dead, after he had declared, all power, all authority is given unto me in heaven and on earth. That means 100 billion galaxies was at his command and disposal. And yet he was not content and satisfied until he had the confession of a crude, rough fisherman who had denied him three times publicly. That he loved him. It was important to him, not that he had just repented of his denial, but that he loved him. Simon, son of Jonas, do you love me? Mm. 
Not do you love my service? Not do you love my work? Not do you love my church? Do you love me? Then he said to him, after Peter said yes, feed my lambs, feed my sheep. There's people here this morning and you love this church, but you don't love him. People here, you're active in this church, but you're not active for him. You're like two people that I remember Mum McDonald and Pop McDonald took me to see in a Methodist church in the Craigie Road. Old Plunkett was the minister then. He was a good old boy. I went with my granda to hear him and he got 90 souls in Mount Pottinger Methodist and then he became a modernist and I fell out with him. Of course, I fall out with a lot of people. I fell out with him. Where did I fall out with him? Crumlin Road Jail. You see, I was humpy because the prisoners were getting their dinner and I had no breakfast and I had no dinner that day. And I was waiting. And he says to me, Jim McConnell, do you actually believe that Jesus fed the 5,000? I says, Hadley. It wasn't 5,000, it was 15,000. It says he fed 5,000 men beside women and children. But there was a young couple, an old, actually an old couple in his church, Mom McDonald and Pop McDonald introduced me to them. And they were lovely people. And I said, tell me when you were saved, sir. Tell me when you were saved. What do you mean, pastor? I said, did you not have that wonderful crisis experience of Christ coming into your heart? No, but we love the church. And I tried to tell him about the Savior. And you know, I had the joy of kneeling down with him and pointing him to Christ, the caretaker and his wife of Craigie. Methodist Church many years ago. Is there people like that here? Is there people like that here? Are you saved, brother? Are you saved? Are you really saved? Has it happened to you? Are you really saved? Are you born again of the Spirit of the living God? I feel I'm talking to people that are greatly interested in the kingdom of God and all that's us, that's but when it comes to the king of the kingdom, there's no emotion, there's no warmth, and there's no love. Listen to me. If you never hear me again, if you don't love him, everything you do in connection with him means nothing. He wants your love. He wants your heart. And that's the sort of person that he is and he will never change. Just to show you the immensity of Mary's gift. Remember the story of the 5,000 that we referred to there? I remember Philip said, 200 penny worth of bread <coughs> wouldn't meet the need of these people a wee bit each. <clears throat> 200 penny worth of bread to feed 5,000 men. Now listen. Mary gave 300. One estimator says that that would have fed 7,500 people. That was her gift, and that what she gave. That was her love, and it was wonderful. I'm closing. In the Old Testament, kings and prophets were anointed. You'll read that in the Old Testament. That was the custom. Kings and prophets were anointed. And by doing this, Mary was saying, you are my prophet, the only one who can give me counsel. <laughs> but you're also my king. You're the only one that I can give allegiance to. Brother and sister this morning, he's my prophet, priest, and king, and I love him. I'm going to say it again. He's my prophet, priest, and king, and I love him. Who loves him this morning?
May God bless his word to all of our hearts. He's a wonderful Savior. Leads me to repentance. It's your goodness that draws me to your side. Your mercy it calls me to be like you. Your favor is my delight. Before we pray, uh, that lady that raised her hand uh, during the altar call, whoever you were, would you, before you go home, would you just call into the McGee room, uh, just beyond the fountain on the left-hand side, and uh, with some literature, we want you to take home with you and be encouraged in the name of the Lord. Let's pray, shall we? Father, we commit ourselves to Thee. We thank You for Your Word. Let Your Word be like seed. Let that seed tumble into our hearts. Let our hearts be receptive to receive it. And may your word grow there. May it be strong and may it bring forth fruit and may it bring forth change in our walk with you and our relationship with you. O oh Lord, increase our love for thee. Separate us now, Lord, with your blessing. Keep your hand upon us. Bring us up again tonight to your house. Be in your house tonight and speak, we pray, and glorify your name. Now may the grace of our Lord Jesus Christ and the love of God and the fellowship of the Holy Spirit rest and remain and abide upon us 
until Jesus comes again. Amen. Turn around and say hello. Good morning and God bless you.